Hey guys, how's everyone doing? This is The Sentinel, watching over Geekdom, and welcome back to Sentinel Reviews. Today we are finishing our look at the Sarah Kingdom trilogy of Companion Chronicles with The Guardian of the Solar System, released in July of 2010, written by Simon Gurrier, directed by Lisa Bowerman. The Guardian of the Solar System once again stars Jean Marsh as Sarah Kingdom and Neil McGregor as Robert, and as always, there will be a spoiler warning in place. And listening through this on my second time was interesting, because on my first listen through of this trilogy, The Guardian of the Solar System was my least favorite. And I want to stress that, least favorite. That does not mean it was bad, that does not mean I thought it was bad, it is still a very good story, it is still consistently amazing with the rest of this trilogy. I just didn't like it as much as I liked The Drowned World, or as much as I liked Home Truths. Although, listening to it again, my thoughts may have changed, potentially. I'm a little more indecisive this time around. I'm not sure... Home Truths is still my favorite in this trilogy, but I'm not sure where I'd rank this one, compared to The Drowned World. But... Let's just jump right into the stories, because again, on the technical side of thing, the writing, the direction, the performances, the chemistry, it's all still phenomenal. And we open with a little prologue here, basically pick, explaining where the last story is left off. Sarah Kingdom's conscience is sort of inhabiting this house that grants wishes, and Robert was sent to investigate her. And he came back when his daughter was sick and asked her to cure her. And in exchange, Sarah asked that Robert never leave. So this story sort of picks up where that story has ended. It's been several years. Robert's daughter is now a grown woman and has left the island. And their relationship has changed again. Robert has sort of begun kind of... He still likes her, but he's kind of begun to resent Sarah for keeping him here, and he feels he is approaching the end of his life, so he wants Sarah to grant one last wish. And while Sarah is telling him the implications of what he's asking for, she decides to tell him her last story. And this one, in the previous two, has been hinted at. So, and... Like I said, like the Drowned World, there's a bit of a disconnect here, because unlike Home Truths, where I liked both stories pretty much on par with each other, I like the framing device story here more than the story within a story, but we'll kind of get into that. So, in this story that Sarah is telling, the Doctor, Stephen, and her arrive in what appears to be a giant clock. And really here, this is one of my issues with this particular story. The pacing seems off. It seems a little bit slower. Um, and not in like a slow burn kind of way where it's like, oh, it's moving slowly, but it's so good. It's like it's moving slowly and you can feel it's moving slowly. Kind of That's kind of one of my problems with Attack of the Clones to make a comparison. Like, a huge chunk of time is just dedicated explaining how a clock works. Which, on paper, I like. It kind of lends to the world building, but it's like... Sarah is just explaining how a clock works. Because that's where her and the Doctor and Steven are. They are in a clock. And they find out pretty quickly that this clock is owned by the... Space Security Service, who the organization that Sarah worked for when she met the Doctor. And as it goes on, um, they don't find this out until the second half of the story, but I'll say it right here. They are, right now in time, the Doctor, Stephen, and Sarah, are a year prior to the events of the Daleks' master plan. So, that's... But, like I said, here in part one, they don't realize that yet. And what ends up happening is Sarah finds out her brother, Brett Vion, is there. And 
I've kind of held up, held off on talking about it in the previous stories because it comes the most into play here. I love Gene Marsh's performance whenever Brett comes up because, again, a quick recap for the Daleks' master plan. The Doctor, Stephen, and Katarina, before she died, met Brett on the planet Kemble. Kemble, where they learned that the Guardian of the Solar System, the man in charge of Earth, a man named Mavic Chen, was selling out his people in exchange for power by teaming up with the Daleks. And what happened is that Brett, is that Mavic Chen was able to get to Earth first, and he told Sarah Kingdom that the Doctor and Steven were enemies and that Brett was a traitor, and she killed her brother in cold blood. And one of my critiques about the Daleks' master plan is this is obviously a very traumatizing moment, you know. This woman believes one of her closest family members is a traitor and she kills him. And it's never touched on, you know, like, after an experiment involving teleportation, the Doctor, Steven, and Sarah whisk to another planet and pretty much we just get one line. Brett Vion was my brother. But through this trilogy, we see how bad killing her brother affected Sarah. Like, it destroyed her on the inside. And that's just one of the phenomenal things about Marsha's performance here is every time she her mind goes to Brett, it's just the utter devastation of what she did. And it also ties into this story the most because she talks about her upbringing in the space security service, how, what is it she said exactly? It was something along the lines of, we were trained to shoot first, ask questions never. We were not trained to show emotions. Things like that. So it's like, she, re and so that's where that regret sets in. She realizes that had she been more investigative, she would have realized something was up. And uh, the stuff with Brett will tie into something I'll try and remember to talk about a little bit later. But anyway, this... Anyway, obviously, Brett takes her to meet Mavic Chen. And Gurrier's writing in assessing Mavic Chen is really good here because... In the Daleks' master plan, Mavic Chen is obviously just a power-mad despot, but Gurrier really expands on what his character is, how he is at his core a politician, so he understands people, he understands how to pull strings, he understands how to manipulate. Like, when he's explaining the clock to Sarah, and Sarah voices her obvious moral issues with this clock, he plays into that. He, you know, he makes the empty promises like, yes, this is a problem, and we are working to fix it, and things like that. And it gives a really good depth to Mavic Chen. You know, he's not just a power-mad conspirator. He's not just, you know, it gives, it, it gives us much more into his character, into his mind, and not in a way that redeems him or makes him a sympathetic villain, which, again, works really well. And this clock they are in. Oh boy, how to explain the clock. It's just... Because the clock itself is a very interesting concept. It's really out there, really well interesting concept. Kind of like the solid tract. But it's... I listened to this explanation multiple times, and I still barely understand it. So here, here's my best assessment of what this clock is. When the Doctor, Stephen, and Sarah arrive, Sarah, um, the Doctor realizes, oh, how can we have come here, that something isn't right, and Sarah asks, could the clock have brought us here? And the Doctor says, no, clocks are only meant to tell time. They are not meant to dictate it. And when Sarah meets Mavic Chen, she learns, that's what he says, this clock dictates time. It acts as a counterweight to the universe and makes space travel much faster than it ever could have been. 
And that's all I understood about it. So it's confusing, yeah, and I guess I do have to kind of take points off for that because despite listening to the explanations numerous times, I just couldn't grasp what this thing was. And the story kind of stops there because we cut back to Sarah and Robert and... Robert tells her that, or I forget what the conversation is, but the conversation they have basically explains more of how this house Sarah lives in works, and they say that, you know, every wish comes with a price, so, oh, I should have listened to, I should have listened to this a third time, because I'm trying to remember what their conversation was, because it's really great, but basically, Robert says, I don't want you to finish the story then. And I presume as he's dying, because they kind of hint that now that his daughter is a grown woman and gone, Robert's an old man and kind of at the end of his life. So anyway, as he's dying, they make a switch. I had to cut away for a minute. Something came up. Sorry about that. So anyway, what happens is that as Robert is dying, Sarah... Or no, as Robert is dying, he makes his last wish. And he and Sarah switch places. Sarah now has a physical form. She now has her own body back. And Robert is the house. And he lets Sarah go. Part 2 picks up two days later. Because Robert's daughter previously left the island, there's now no way for Sarah to leave. And so she comes back to the house and points out that she doesn't want to stay confined to this house anymore. So, she wishes for a way to leave. And Robert tells her, I can grant your wish. And Sarah says, I was the house for a thousand years. Every wish made comes with a price. And I have nothing to give. And Robert says, you could give me the rest of that story. And this is... The second part here of this story within a story, this is, again, where it kind of lost me. Because for this chunk of the story, until we get to the climax, this is really weak. Because Sarah's talking about the philosophical debates of this clock with Mavic Chen. Because what happened is, basically, it's run by old men. It's run by prisoners who are sort of enslaved to the clock. And Sarah finds that wrong. She So, but really that's the constant debate. They are having a back and forth here. And throughout this story, I can't believe I forgot this. Throughout this story, Sarah is starting to realize this. The implications here. Because she is a year earlier than the events of the Daleks' master plan. Brett is still alive, and for all she knows, Mavic Chen has not allied with the Daleks yet. So, she starts to think, oh, I have a way of stopping this. Because to everyone else, Sarah Kingdom is still supposed to be stationed on Venus, and she is. But then, and Mavic Chen, impressed with... Sarah's gumption with her seeking out this clock and debating him, he says he's going to promote her. And then it all clicks for Sarah. Because while she's being promoted, her past self is getting the news that she's been promoted. And she will be on her way back to Earth. Sarah has not stopped the events of the Daleks' master plan. She's put them in motion. And we get a little bit more of the clock here. I'm sorry I was so fast on that. But there is a lot to unpack in the last moments of this story. And we kind of learn more about how the clock works. And how the prisoners are so cowed into servicing it. Because the Doctor and Stephen end up enslaved to the clock as well. Much like Sarah as the house. Much like the house. The clock feeds off desire. You know, these prisoners think they can escape, 
and so they try to sabotage the clock, but the clock feeds off that and turns it into working for the clock. You know, she says, Sarah says something along the lines of, as we go through the assembly line, these old men are trying to hit the clock, trying to break it to no avail. And it's their continual fighting the clock that's keeping them enslaved. So what happens is Sarah willingly surrenders herself to the clock rather than fighting it. And Robert points out something here in this story that I didn't notice. In the, that I didn't notice. In this trilogy, each situation has been resolved because Sarah essentially martyred herself. In Home Truths, she surrendered herself to the house. In The Drowned World, she willingly plunged into the deadly water. And in The Guardian of the Solar System, she surrenders herself to the will of the clock. And when Robert brings this up, he asks, why did you do this? And it's kind of a... And we see, and this is really where we see how much killing Brett affected Sarah. Because she says, I wasn't trying to martyr myself. I wasn't trying to be a hero. I was just tired. I, I had, I was done. Brett, killing my brother weighed so heavily on me that I thought, maybe this is how I release myself. And it's a really heartbreaking conclusion. I love how... Because in the past, I've said I love tragic stories. I love bleak stories. I'm a bit of a sadist. And I love just how bleak this trilogy has been about how broken Sarah is over the events of the Daleks' master plan. And by surrendering herself in to the clock, the clock begins to break apart because... By fighting, by feeding off the desire to fight back against the clock, it that was basically the gears. And because Sarah surrendered herself rather than fighting, the gears didn't catch. And then we get another cliffhanger ending. And I like that this story ends unresolved. I think it kind of lends to the tragic beauty of this trilogy. Sarah, Sarah's wish, obviously, was... A way off the island. And in exchange, Robert said she wanted the end of this story. And then we learn and then we had that conversation about Sarah being tired, being done, sick of having Brett's conscience, Brett's death weigh on her conscience. And Robert tells her, I can't absolve you of your sins, Sarah. I can't forgive you. I that's not my job, but I know someone who can. And this story ends with Robert summoning the TARDIS. And Sarah freaking out, saying, I can't face the doctor, don't make me do this. I, I'm not ready, I can't do this. And Robert basically says, the doctor might be the only one who can put your conscience at ease. So, what'll it be? And that is the end of the Sarah Kingdom trilogy, the Guardian of the Solar System. Oh, there was no third option. That was meant. There was meant to be an and there. I'm gonna give the Guardian of the Solar System a eight out of ten. Because again, in the sort of second half, the story within a story. Whoops, the story within a story kind of just loses me a bit. Not much, but still. And like I said. Listening to the trilogy as a whole, coming to the end here, we just get a lot of that beautifully tragic um, storytelling that I love so much. So, those are my thoughts on the Guardian of the Solar System. What were yours? Start a conversation in the comments below. Hey guys, I just had a quick announcement, and then I will be announcing what story arc I'll be covering next. So, after I upload this... Because I'm filming this in advance, but this time frame refers to the date I upload this. I will be taking a brief little hiatus. Nothing serious. It's only going to be two weeks. It's just... There are things 
big finish titles I like to listen to, I want to listen to on, in my free time. I want to listen to them leisurely without the intention of reviewing them. And doing the reviews, listening to titles for reviews, eats up a lot of time. I have to listen to them, formulate my thoughts, possibly take notes, re-listen to them to solidify those thoughts. And, yeah, it's just a bit of a lengthy process, and it leaves no time for leisurely listening, free listening. So, again, before I start my next story arc, after uploading this, just a little two-week break. And that is only in regards to the next story arc I'm planning to review. So, for example, it's August, Diary of River Song 6 is coming out this month. And if that comes out during my sabbatical... I will definitely cover it in a review, don't worry. So yeah, I'm just saying, but yeah, that little break is in regards to the next story arc I'll be reviewing. Which brings us to that very subject, the next story arc I'll be reviewing. There were four arcs I had in mind, and so I threw up a poll and left it to the people who follow me and to decide. And I have the results right here, and I'll display them in a moment. I asked this poll on Twitter. The Twitter poll ended up being a tie, so then I asked it on Facebook. So the results have been compounded as best as possible. Twitter only shows you the number of votes, the number of people who voted on your poll in total, and the options are displayed as percents. So I had to do math. So my math may be off because there were decimal points and rounding, so... Anyway, the results of both polls. In fourth place, at 14 polls, at four polls, 14 votes was the, as far as I remember, Big Finish's first foray into Season 18, the fourth Doctor Adventures Series 6. In third place, at 16 votes, was the fifth Doctor story arc, The Key to Time. In second place, at 17 votes, was the another fifth Doctor story arc, the Older Nyssa arc. And what I will be reviewing next, at in first place, obviously, at 38 votes, the Sixth Doctor and Charlotte Pollard. So yeah, again, two-week break, and I will come back with The Condemned. But in the meantime, like, comment, subscribe, click the bell next to notification, click the bell next to subscribe to get notifications when I upload. In the description box below, you'll find the link to my Kofi where you can support the channel, and you'll also find the link to my Twitter where you can follow me and get updates on the channel. This is the Sentinel watching over Geekdom, and I'll see you guys next time.